Poyuli, you grow it as a perennial. Um, so you grow it, and then if you have a, a fall planting, you could get your first harvest in about 18 months. If it's a spring planting, you have to wait two years, because the first year it's really establishing its root system. Hello and welcome to the Crop Science Podcast. My name is Brian Arnell. I'm an extension specialist at Oklahoma State University with specialization in precision nutrient management. I can deal with all the technology and all the nutrients in crop production. Today, our guest is Dr. Katrina Cornish. She's an endowed chair and Ohio eminent research scholar at the Ohio State University working within bioemergent materials. Dr. Cornish is a global expert on alternate rubber and latex production processing and products with 30, greater than 30 years of rubber biosynthesis, physiology, germplasm improvement, production systems innovation, and alternative feedstocks in the government, commercial, and university sectors. Her inventions and leadership provide the foundation of the current worldwide efforts to develop materials at, you know, at The Ohio State University. A fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, an American Association for Advancement of Science, and founder and CEO of Energy In Incorporated and several other startup companies. She leads a program on alternate rubber production, bio-based fillers, and exploration of opportunity feedstocks from agriculture, food processing waste for value-added products and biofuels. Well, Katrina, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really intrigued. I've dug a little bit into your, your research and I want to say it's far beyond what I've ever dealt with. So if you don't mind, um, you know, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, some of uh, your early early starts in academia and what you're doing today. Well, thank you, Brian, for inviting me to give this uh, podcast. Um, so um, I originally come from England and I did both my undergraduate and graduate degrees at the University of Birmingham. And in background, I'm a stress physiologist, though that seems a long way back. Uh, so I moved out to the U.S., um, part of Maggie Thatcher's brain drain, actually, and worked at, did postdocs at Michigan State, Cornell, and then in Arizona. And that's when I first started working on rubber-producing crops. And it turned out that coincided with when Goodyear had lobbied the USDA to set up a project on domestic rubber production. And I got hired to head up that project. And I spent the next 15 and a half years in uh, the Western Regional Research Center in Albany, California. Now, the original premise was find the enzymes and genes that make natural rubber and stick them in corn or in, in yeast and put them in the back of the freezer in case there was a catastrophic crop failure of the tropical rubber tree. And we're still waiting for the complete catastrophic failure to happen, but they're grown as clones, and so they're extremely prone to disease. And in the last six months of 2019, it only took six months for a million acres across seven countries to become diseased with two leaf blights, Neophysococcus and Pestilotiopsis. And 2020 saw a 10% drop in the global rubber production supply. Now, the only reason you didn't really hear a huge amount about that because it coincided with COVID. And COVID closed down uh, all the tire factories. And so that 10% didn't have nearly the bite it would otherwise have done. But 10% is about what we import into the United States. And we have no back, we have no domestic rubber production in the US at all. This is a huge uh, catastrophe waiting to happen. Because as I say, they're clones, six months in a million acres in seven countries, and that's not even the worst Hevea disease. So Dr. Cornish, um, I hate to interrupt, but why is it that the the rubber uh, why are, why are we using clones is what is it about the production system and and the rubber uh, the rubber production system that it's clones that are used and not not anything else well this is because when the brazilian rubber tree or the power rubber tree was moved from brazil out to sri lanka originally um, only a very few plants uh, made the crossing as it were went through kew gardens and out to uh, singapore and then sri lanka um, so the original genetic basis for rubber tree rubber production is very narrow. And then they selected from among the plants, among the trees, for the ones that had the highest yield. 
And then they bud grafted those on the seedling rootstocks. And so just historically, to get the highest yield, bees were all cloned. But it does mean that their genetic base is extremely narrow. You could go for miles and miles and miles, and they're genetically identical. Uh, and it's just being grandfathered in like that. Uh, because then they have very reproducible yields, very reproducible system, very reproducible trees for tapping. Uh, but the biological risk to that has been largely ignored. And the reason it moved was moved out there primarily was because in Brazil, which is where it comes from, there's an endemic fatal disease called uh, South American leaf blight or cell. And it's very interesting that until... October of last year, if you tried to fly from an endemic South region into Southeast Asia, there were no direct flights. You couldn't do it. You had to go somewhere else first and then fly into that region. And as to keep South out of Southeast Asia, because it's extremely contagious. Now, uh, and it can't make the ocean crossing because the spores only live about five days, but it can certainly make the airplane crossing. Now, in October of last year, I think probably because of the Brazil-China trade talks, they opened up direct flights. I guess it was too inconvenient to have to fly somewhere else and get off the plane. But it does now mean that there is this route to introduce salve into Southeast Asia that did not exist before. So I think the risk of introducing salve has gone up quite a lot because of that change. That's fascinating. So take a take a moment or two and you know, help us understand what what is your research, you know, the focus of the work and what you've been working on to help, you know, provide a, an opportunity here. Yes, I, I, I could do that. So one of the big reasons we don't have domestic rubber production is because it can't compete on a small scale with commodity rubber from Southeast Asia and West Africa. This is because top dollar for rubber tappers is only $10 a day, and that's more than most of them get. Now, we can't do that sort of thing in the States. Now, if you're producing a few hundred acres and using a pilot plant, there's no way you can produce domestic rubber for a dollar a kilo. You know, it's going to be 10 or $20 a kilo. So that's, that's so in times of emergency or cut, uh, supply cutoffs, you know, when the supply has been cut off like World War II, uh, the oil embargo of the 70s and 80s when petroleum became very, very expensive and the prices of synthetic rubber went up very high and brought natural rubber prices with them, that's when the federal government and industry has dumped tons of money on let's do domestic rubber. But as soon as normal commercial uh, situations return and the rubber price drops, then they say, oh, don't need it. Uh, it's gone again. And so it's been this stop, start, stop, start. And so uh, my research has always been focused on how do you get this to go in normal economic times? And then going back to when I first started working on this, as I mentioned, we were looking for enzymes and genes. Um, so in the approaches I was taking, I was already aware that the protein profile of the different rubber producing species was quite different. And if you raised antibodies against one, you didn't see a lot of cross reaction with others. Then in 91, type one latex allergy became a huge problem in the United States. We had a lot of deaths. Uh, over 10% of the, of the population ended up with this awful type 1 latex allergy. And the death rate for anaphylaxis to this is about 50%. You know, spina bifida kids and paraplegics got up to like 70%. It was a huge, huge problem. And this was caused because of, of the AIDS epidemic. It's very interesting how things all tie together. But the CDC said everybody has to wear gloves now. And demand went from about 2 billion to 30 billion just like that and per year. And so the, um, uh, a lot of new manufacturers sprang up over the Far East and they stopped washing the gloves during the process of manufacturing. Now this led or left all the soluble proteins in the gloves because when you tap the latex, you're actually tapping a cytoplasm filled with all sorts of goodies, including tons of proteins and the rubber particles in the emulsion. Now, before, you'd make this, this glove, and in the mid middle, you'd wash it, and all those soluble proteins would be removed. Now they were left in, and the patients washed them out in their, in their bodies. And, and as powder was still used in those days, it's only recently been uh, uh, eliminated, uh, that in the glove, the powder 
inside the glove would attract these soluble proteins. They would stick to the powder. And then as the nurses put the glove on, a few minutes later, take the glove off, snap, the powder, protein-covered powder would go in the air. And the healthcare workers would spend all day breathing it in. And they would be extracting these proteins with their lung mucosa. I remember that powder. I, you, you, you described that, and I remember it. Like yeah, it yeah, yeah. Well, if you had high protein gloves, you were then breathing in high protein powder and you'd get these type 1 latex allergies. More than 10% of our healthcare workforce at that time had to retire through disabilities because they could no longer work in the area without being at danger of an anaphylactic reaction. It was, it was a terrible time. Now, that's mostly been fixed. So gloves are, are leached now, but it just, um, uh, anyway, but anyway, it was a huge problem. So I already knew that at least one of these domestic potential crops, or Wayuli in this case, which is from the Chihuahuan Desert. So it's a perfect crop for the Southwest, especially with these serious droughts that are preventing a lot of our farmers from even being able to grow cotton and alfalfa anymore. Um, that I proposed that that first international conference, why don't we use Wayuli latex instead of Havaya latex? It's softer, it's stretchier, it's the best film product. You, know, you make better films than any other material, and it does not cross-react with type 1 latex allergy. And even if you've got full-blown uh, latex allergy, you can use these materials safely and still be protected from disease. So that then led, us, led me to split the project, and uh, we did commercialize it briefly, but that company... Uh, I, I ended up working for them for, for six years. Uh, it went very well for the first three, uh, and the company was being built for sale. That didn't actually happen, but we had, uh, and then it had to turn itself into an operating company. Um, didn't do quite so well, and then I left for OSU, and the company went bankrupt two years, two years later because they built a processing plant that didn't actually work. <laughs> But we took it through the demonstration scale. So it went from pilot to demonstration. And we had about 3,500 acres of Wayuli in uh, Arizona. So it almost made it. And then when I came to OSU, I started trying to do it again, and hence my company Energene um, to do Wayuli latex um, uh, commercialization and do it properly this time. <laughs> uh, we're still trying to get the money. It's, it always looks very close. We're still, still attempting that. But to say for a, for a, uh, for a crop for the in the desert southwest, it's, it's ideal. Bridgestone is working on that too. They're now uh, they've got a lot of government money uh, trying to do um, tire rubber from uh, Wayuli, and they are uh, recruiting farmers out there, and uh, they ha are making Formula One race car tires. You see, the, the the big issue in the past has been that the tire companies have really really wanted this. But as soon as they make some beautiful tire, you know, Cooper tire made a 100% Wayuli tire, fantastic, uh, over spec in every respect. Uh, and then so, well, when are you going to release this? Well, when can I buy the rubber as cheaply as I can get the tropical rubber? Well, tires, Formula One maybe is a sufficiently specialty, but we've always worked very much on trying to enter the market in those really high margin markets, you know. We, we're hoping to get an FDA approval, 510K, in the spring for the first natural radiation attenuation medical glove, which you can't actually make with Havea rubber because you can't get enough of the radiation attenuation filler into it without reducing the performance properties below the mechanical properties required for surgical and examination gloves by the FDA. Now, Wayuli, you can you could do that with Wayuli because the polymer filler interaction is much greater. And so you can get a lot more filler in it and it's softer and stretchy, stretchier to start with. And so you've got a lot of room before you hit those uh, thresholds. And Havea has much less room. And so you can't actually meet the attenuation standard and the performance standard in one go. But Wayuli can. Now, I'm, I'm intrigued. As, as an agronomist, I'm very intrigued about Wayuli. I have not spent much time we're learning into it so you mentioned about the you know utilizing this crop could supplement or go into regions of cotton or alfalfa is it how's its water usage how's its production and how would it fit into a production system that is traditional for alfalfa or cotton well with with Wayuli, you grow it as a perennial um so you grow it and then if you have a a fall planting, you could get your first harvest in about 18 months. If it's a spring planting, you have to wait two years. 
because the first year it's really establishing its root system. You don't get a really big top, but the next year you get a nice big top. Then we cut that off near the ground, so we take a pollard basically, and then you extract that. Um, you extract that, and uh, the plant will regrow. And then a year later, you can go get it again. And the rubber is produced in the ordinary bark parenchyma cells, so you can't tap it. You basically would harvest it, take the leaves off, make yourself a Wyuli milkshake and then separate out the latex like cream from milk using technology from the dairy industry. Um, the amount of water it uses is less than half of cotton or, cotton or alfalfa. So and remember, it comes from the Chihuahua Desert. Now, it will grow uh, and survive on like eight inches a year, but it's not going to grow very big. So you do still want to uh, water it, uh, irrigate it in times of drought so that you can actually get a harvest every year. Um, and so the, the, the real beauty of it, though, is you can harvest any particular day of the year. A particular field can only be harvested once a year, but the next field can be harvested on a different day, and the next field can ha be harvested on a different day. So you can harvest every single day of the year. Yeah, you can stage it nicely across so you always have a, a constant supply of fresh. Exactly. And so the capex for your processing plant is much less than, it's, than if it was something like uh, – tomatoes, <laughs> where you open up your factories for two months of the year and they're mothballed the rest of the time. Actually, no concern about storage facilities or massive storage facilities because your harvest window is 30 days. So that's How long what does the standard or in a production system, what's the longevity of a stand? Well, we think it, it will go for 10 years um, and then you'd probably have much better lines coming out of the universities or different breeding programs and you'd want to replace it anyway. Um, and the other beauty of Waiuli, which is one of the two leading contenders for the U.S., we could talk about the other one in a minute, um, but the other thing is it, you don't need to use any pesticides on this thing. It's only when you're getting your stand established, if you're using direct seeding, that you need to have some herbicide help there. But apart from that, because it's a terpene crop, it's got lots of volatile terpenes come off the, off the leaves. It's got resin vessels that uh, make the wood really unpalatable to termites. They, they, they would starve to death rather than eat it, uh, at least some of the species that we've tested. Um, but nothing will, it's not, it's not toxic, but it's, I think it's the boiled spinach of the, of, the, of the insect world. You know, they just don't like it and would much rather eat something else unless there's nothing else on offer. And the same goes for herbivores. You know, they, they can eat it, you know, goats and rabbits can eat it, but they don't want to eat it. It's, it's only if they have to, and there's nothing else on offer. Um, so I think it will be an absolutely fantastic crop in, in the semi-arid southwest for the bees coming off the almond orchards in California as they start to move east because it's clean pollen and clean nectar. And these poor things have been pollinating like mad with nicotinamide uh, insecticides all over the place. Um, and so... They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty sickly as they come off those orchards. And I think uh, migrating through, you know, a few hundred miles of Wayuli would be a wonderful recovery opportunity for the bees. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry to keep us on this track. I'm just so fascinated with this crop. And we'll, I'll let you, I promise I'll let you go to your, your newer work. But how far north in, in can this crop make it? Because I look at our, our high plains in Oklahoma where we're losing the aquifer but we do have a fairly harsh winter. So it's a short winter, but it can be harsh. Well, it can be grown from the high plains of Texas, southern high plains, all the way up through the Central Valley of California, um, up to uh, certainly Merced, a bit further north. Uh, so you've got this big swath. And compared with uh, the, the survey that was done in World War II for the growing regions, I think it's moved a little further north. So I think there are some parts of Oklahoma and U Utah uh, and uh, that could, and um, Nevada that can grow this is competing more with housing than than crops. Uh, there was 100 and, over 123 million acres identified in World War II, and I think there's more because we've been uh, the weather has been moving, you know, with climate change and stuff. That we now with Oklahoma, you, you, what it doesn't like is to be buried in snow, so. If, if it can take snow, uh, but it has to melt pretty quick. It, a couple of days, you're okay. But if you're buried in snow for a month, uh, you're going to be dead. 
uh, and the same if, if you flood it and it stays flooded for, for a couple of weeks, then you'll get root rot uh, because this is a desert species and it's high oxygen requiring and it doesn't like to be suffocated. You know, so um, so there in Oklahoma, you, you, you have to you have to be careful and it can go below zero. It can go below freezing, but not a lot below freezing. This is you know, minus 26. No. <laughs> so, I don't I don't survive well in minus 26 myself so yeah, well, we, we have those sorts of temperatures in Ohio so this or Yuli, we have that in a greenhouse here this is not a crop for Ohio so so transitioning because because I, I don't want to take up all your time today tell us a little bit more about what your you know the, the current research and, and the current topics you're really working yeah. on right now so with with uh, Wayuli, we've been working a lot on these premium products you know the gloves I mentioned those those go for over $60 a pair with maybe $2 worth of materials in it. So that type of margin means that even at 300 acres would give you 50% market share. But with that type of profit margin, there's plenty of money for that lucky farmer growing that 300 because <laughs> we need more products, lineman's gloves and then condoms and catheter balloons, things like this. So there's more than one farmer who's going to make a fortune. <laughs> um, but anyway, up in the northern states, there the, the crop play is rubber dandelion. And there's two companies out there, Farm Materials and Cultivat, that are working on commercializing this. And then OSU in collaboration with um, uh, uh, Oregon State University and University of Nebraska and Scotts Bluff and University of Akron have been working on uh, getting this into a, into a good crop state. And we have several scientists here working on worked on weed tolerance and uh, genetic tools, molecular breeding, so uh, and, and and looking at getting farmers to trial this with mother baby trials, things like that. And so the rubber dandelion um, is a root crop. It does make it in lettuces, but of course you can't uh, you can't tap roots, <laughs> even if it was cost effective to do so. So what you do with that, you grow, if you're growing the crop in the field, and we're like eight generations in for breeding for field vigor, you know, so we get nice big roots in the field. It does prefer a lighter soil. Um, if it's heavy clay, you're going to not get really good root development. You know, you want something quite light, um, and but does need some water. Uh, and it will overwinter, so you've got a choice. If you plant it in the spring, um, you can harvest it uh, late fall. We recommend as late as possible because as the winter starts to say, I'm coming, the roots will grow like mad and an amount of rubber, which is in some way related to overwintering tolerance, cold tolerance, that will double up. So you'll get a lot of, uh, a lot of um, rubber being formed in that late part of the, of the year. Um, so our best yields actually have been from doing transplants because we've got a fairly short season up here and that gave us a couple more months on the hoof, as it were. Um, so, uh, but in our polar vortex winter, which is that 12, 13 or 13, 14, I forget exactly what it was, we didn't go above zero for more than two months and we were down every night at that minus 26. It was horrible, <laughs> really brutal. But half the crop that overwintered survived and came back in the spring. So. We did not lose, uh, it, it was tolerant of that. Well, Yuli would have been dead as a doornail, but rubber dandelion made it through. Um, but so you can overwinter if you if that turns out to be the best way. Um, so that's one route, and farm materials and cultivat are working with other companies to get this into the field as a field crop. And, and uh, farm materials is partnered with Goodyear, and both of them have grants from Biomade. Um, but the other thing that we have developed is a repeat harvest indoor farming system. So an ebb and flow hydroponics, which would be very adaptable to aeroponics. Um, and there you could cut the roots off in five weeks, grow them back, cut them off in another five weeks, grow them back, cut them off in another five weeks. And the concentration of rubber in those roots is the same as what you get in the field after whole season. Um, so it's a much more highly productive system. So if a bear fails, if the rubber tree, tropical rubber tree fails, the quickest way to get rubber would be through indoor farming in greenhouses or vertical indoor farms, like a lot of our hydroponic lettuces and herbs are grown that way now. So it'd be, it's well-known technology and could be very rapidly scaled up for rubber production. 
like a like hundred hundred acres of greenhouse with its own processing plant, you know, to get rubber in a hurry. If we if we had to produce all of all of our rubber needs in situ in country, how much would that take? I mean, how much rubber are we importing and how much production would it have to be ramped well, up? Well, we're, imp- we're importing about a million tons, and that's just for manufacturing. We're importing, if you count all the other things we import that contain rubber, and there's 50,000 of them that contain rubber, but we, but we import that other countries make them and we import them. That's probably another 4 million tons. So our, our requirement in the U.S. is around 5 million tons of natural rubber. And it's because so many things can't be made without it. You can't make a tire without natural rubber. There are no 100% synthetic rubber tires. Not that you, so a car tire, although you can make it 100% natural, most of our car tires are about 50% natural, 50% synthetic for the elastomer component. There's other things in tires, you know, nylon, steel, and things like that. Um, but uh, an airplane tire is 100% natural. Truck tires are over 90. You know, so the higher the... Tractor tires, 100. So the higher the performance of the tire, the higher the percentage of natural rubber. You can't land a tire, uh, an airplane, on synthetic tires containing any synthetic rubber because they'll blow up on landing. And um, when I've talked to pilots on the aircraft carriers, they say those tires that the Navy jets land with, those are single-use 100% natural rubber. <laughs> and they used to chuck them overboard, but they have to take them to home base uh, these days because of polluting the oceans, you know. <laughs> so if we scale up and look at just what could a hundred acre of, of a grow facility, a greenhouse facility like we were talking about, how much rubber could a hundred acre facility produce in a single year? In a multiple harvest system, if you are doing a multiple harvest system, you could get a hundred a hundred thousand tons per year. Okay. You could get a ton per acre off that with with multiple harvests up to seven harvests a year for the for the field growth uh the field operation where you're taking the root up is that similar to a sugar beet harvest i mean would you yeah you can use you can use sugar beet harvester ginseng harvester a potato harvester the issue with with it's how big are the plants you're able to grow on your particular soil type because uh, the gaps in the in the belt you know they have to be close enough that as you're harvesting, your, your plant doesn't just fall right through back on the back on your field. Um, and then the issue is, do you take the tops off first or second? And then depending on how crowded you make it, you can, if you crowd it, the rosettes will start to stand up, which then suggests you may be able to use a carrot harvester if your tops are standing up, you know, so that that isn't fully developed. But of course, the big issue with commercial scale dandelion production is weed control because it does not have a whole bunch of things uh, keeping other weeds from growing. And I don't know what your weeds are like in Oklahoma, but Ohio just has waves of different species come through during the season. And you have to, in effect, the challenge is how do you kill the dandelions without killing the dandelions? Yeah, I just imagine as you're saying that all the weeds that would be uh, competitive and near same species in the broadleaf family that would just yes, be an yes. disaster. Broadleaf weed control is the big challenge. Now we have developed. This was with one of our scientists, our professors who's since retired, um, but he developed a, a protocol with two pre-emergence and one post-emergent herbicide, which have worked really well. And then his work's being continued by Dr. Chris Nado here, uh, where they've done uh, many generations now of broadcast seed out into the field spray it, collect the few survivors. And they make tons of seed, of course, and then you, you, you scale that seed up, you put it back out again, you spray it with a higher concentration. You do, so we have, we have naturally selected herbicide resistant plants, um, as well as, of course, you can do it with genetic engineering. Now, people do tend to panic a little bit about that. You know, what if you make the common dandelion herbicide resistant? No, no. <laughs> but there's no gene flow into from rubber, dandy, dan, rubber dandelion into common dandelion uh, because common dandelion is actually in North America, it's uh, what we call a triploid apomictic plant. But it basically means it doesn't cross fertilize with anything. So each dandelion, if you look at it, if you sowed the seeds of that particular dandelion, all of its children would be identical to that mother. And it doesn't accept the pollen from rubber dandelion, which is a outbreeding diploid. So it, it doesn't it doesn't select it. Now going the other way, there's a little bit of gene transfer, but it's very low. 
That's fascinating. Um, I guess one of my last questions before we, we have some other questions, Rabbi, one of the last questions is when you're working on this kind of work and you find something like the rubber dandelion, what kind of regulations you look at a crop that it could have great potential or has good potential? Is there a lot of regulation? Because it's not going into food, but it is going into the medical industry. So what kind of regulation is there on bringing in a new rubber source, a new natural rubber source? Well, the only thing that, from the rubber perspective, it has to qualify in terms of the performance of the product you make with it. Um, so we know that we need high molecular weight rubber. So that's the first thing that you look at. It is, does this species make high molecular weight rubber? And then it's a case of how do you get it out? How do you produce it? Um, and what changes do you need to make with your compound formulations to create the properties that you need? Um, and looking at both the ASTM standards and the FDA regulations for what are uh, what's required. Of course, Wayuli rubber can, uh, exceeds all of those standards, and dandelion rubber looks very similar in properties to tropical rubber. So, so uh, it's, it's, there's no problem meeting that type of regulation. The biggest challenge for dandelion, if we started to introduce the transgenics and the gene-edited plants, is APHIS is giving them the confidence that, uh, you know, that there really is no gene flow. But, but there, there isn't. We've already published several papers on that. Um, so it shouldn't be a huge problem. But this is one of the reasons we did the natural, you know, the spray and pray and weigh approach uh, for increasing herbicide resistance because APHIS doesn't really care about that. If you do it that route, they only care about it if you do it the other way. Uh, but but for the ecological, the agroecological implications are exactly the same, whichever you do. So we wanted to do all those gene flow studies anyway, but it's it's not going to make common dandelion um, uh, herbicide resistant. And so far, we have no indication that rubber dandelion can become weedy. I wish we had that problem, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's not it's not vigorous enough. It, it will grow well with itself, but it, it's very poor competitor with weeds. So, you know, if, 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 if you have an escape and it lands somewhere else, your new crop there or your weeds on the verge, they, they will all outcompete it and it won't, it won't make it. Is the extraction process fairly energy heavy? How's the extraction compared to the, the traditional natural rubber? Well, the tradition we have cost is you tap the tree for $10 a day if you're lucky and collect it in little cups. Uh, the amount they collect, by the way, is equivalent to more than 13 full-grown African elephants a minute. <laughs> yeah, you know, so so there's a, a lot of very poorly paid people doing a very uh, it's a semi-school job, actually. But nonetheless, that's how it's done. And then you dry a whole bunch of it or coagulate it if you're going to make tires. So about 89% is solidified and you know, turned into solid rubber and the rest goes for latex. Um, one comment on that, of course, you... We've needed a lot more. I don't know if you recall, but I said when AIDS came, we used 2 billion, it jumped to 30. Well, before COVID, we were already using 300 million, uh, 300 billion. So remember, in my, in my lifetime, when I started this, it was two. Now it's 300. With COVID, it doubled to 600 billion. That's another million tons of latex a year to make another, uh, to make 2 billion gloves, you need a million tons of latex. I had a note to ask about if we had time to ask about the impact of COVID on latex demands, because I only assumed it probably doubled. So Yeah, and, and nitrile was able to pick up about a million, a million tons, a, a million, a, a billion gloves, I mean, a billion gloves, but not the other two billion. Um, and of course, nitrile doesn't make nearly as good a glove as the natural latices do. Uh, but even though it's the exam glove market is heavily dominated by that because of type 1 latex allergy. But you get better disease protection out of out of a natural latex glove, and it's not dangerous provided it's leached during manufacture. So the the plant extraction is it a squeezing extraction? Uh, no, for, for the dandelion, uh, Wayuli, uh, if you're going okay, if you're going for latex, they use the same process. So milkshake, then separate out the cream, like latex that cream from milk because it's lighter than water. Now, if you're doing solid rubber. In dandelion, most a lot of the rubber, the latex is already coagulated into solid rubber in the plant. So the best methods for that at the moment are take take the roots, dry them, and then extract it all as solid rubber. And another of our professors here, uh, Dr. Fred Michelle, has developed an enzyme-assisted 
uh, extraction process for producing rubber um, and it's uh, all, all water-based. The latex extraction is also all water-based, which don't use as a solvent-based system, as I believe uh, Cultivat and uh, Pharma Tours, I believe, are using solvent. Uh, I know they've looked at the different possibilities. Um, and uh, so Bridgestones is basically they'll dry it in the field partially and then they'll finish drying it at the processing plant and they'll chip it, solvent extract it, um, and then uh, purify it and, and get the rubber that way. Um, but you can go straight from the latex to a deresonated uh, Wayuli rubber if you're going to use or, or dandelion rubber. So you can go through the latex route. And I prefer the water-based route myself. Um, but that's, you get only good rubber that way. All, any degraded rubber doesn't come through that process. So you don't have to worry about separating that out later. It's time for our famous three. Well, as we wrap up, I have three uh, personal questions, I guess, as, the, as they like to set up for this podcast. And so we'll wrap up with these three final questions. The first one they ask is, uh, what is your favorite crop-related book or resource? So what, what's a what's a resource you've gone back to over the years or just a favorite book to read? Well, Mark Finley has got a really good book about the um, um, the, the politics behind domestic rubber production uh, between uh, the beginning of the industry uh, and the end of World War II. Um, so that, that one's a really good one. I'd have to go and have a look for the title. It's got a fairly long title, <laughs> uh, but it was by Mark, Mark Finley. Um, he was working on the next one, but unfortunately he tragically died in a car accident. And so that the next one, and then, and then there's one that's very interesting by Wade Davis called One River, uh, which is uh, the story of his mentor, Schultz, who collected uh, Havea, was in charge of extensive um, Havea collections from the Amazon in the modern era. And the USDA did have a plantation of tolerant, of salve tolerant trees. But Ezra Benson, uh, when he was uh, the Secretary of Agriculture in charge of AMS, I think, think at USDA, why are, we, why are we paying for this? We don't have Havea trees in the States. So they destroyed it all, threw it all away. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it's very interesting. But both of those books do have stuff in the beginning about the appalling atrocities that were committed by the European rubber barons in Brazil and, and related countries. So you need a, those, and they're awful. You know, I, 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 don't, I never reread those initial chapters because the abuse was just appalling. You, you can't imagine how bad it was. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you don't want to get nightmares about it, don't read the first couple of chapters of either of those books. And uh, so the final question would be, if you were to give any guidance to uh, a graduate student or young, young scientist, early career scientist who's getting into this field, any you know, little tidbits of advice for them to, to make sure that they, they're successful and can set themselves apart? Well, one is perseverance <laughs> and then work on what interests you the most. You know, if, you, if you're not working on something that you find in this, interesting, that's a, a terrible thing to do to your career. You know, if it's not of in interest to you, you're just doing it for the stipend, you know, um, that's not going to be a satisfying career. And for something job, like this, yeah, so for, for, rubber, for rubber biosynthesis or, or rubber producing crops, this is the long, the long road. But if we can get them established, which I hope to completely finish in my lifetime, um, then there's an enormous, enormous potential. Just imagine we spread this out. We need 600 processing plants. We need this across the U.S. We could become a rubber exporting country. Think about all the hundreds of, well, not hundreds, all of the thousands or tens of thousands of people who've made their careers in corn, you know, those are all to be done in rubber producing domestic crops. And then if you're a plant breeder, you know, you break out the champagne in corn. If you made like half a percent difference, we could double the yield in a year, you know. <laughs> so, you know, getting in, getting in early at the beginning of what should be a massive new crop, you know, arguably you could say the last one that really made it in the States was soybean. But just imagine becoming one of the people at the beginning of soybean, you know, or beginning of corn, you know, 
we are still in the in the baby steps for for domestic rubber crops. So it's a very exciting uh, uh, option for production. Very much. Well, Dr. Cornish, thank you so much for your time today. I've been absolutely intrigued. I didn't know what I was going to be getting into with with just being this podcast host and to to think that you're my first, I was really uh, like, you're my first interview. So I did not know where to go. And this has just been so, so pleasurable. I've just had so much fun with you on. Thank you for oh, taking oh, the time. Good. Thank you. And, and I really hope my dream on this, I want to be able to drive down the interstate, interstates in any part of the States and either see the golden dandelion fields <laughs> on either side with the occasional processing plant looming in the distance or in the south, southwest, the same for Waiuli, drive past those you know, miles upon miles of, of, of Waiuli crops with processing plants scattered amongst them. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much.